Okay, so from the future of aging, we'll make a generational leap backward with our next speaker. Just a few weeks ago, I co-hosted a dinner in Los Angeles with Moj Madara, who you'll hear from tomorrow. And on the far end of the table, there was a young, remarkable man. And we got to talking and met later that week in Los Angeles for tea. There was just something about Patrick Finnegan that gave me a little bit of new insight into his generation. I also learned that he was a serial entrepreneur, having started his first company at the age of 14. He is now a venture capitalist at the ripe age of 21. Patrick's startup mindset and personal journey demonstrate that the tried and true path in some cases can limit one's ability to reach their full potential. And that's a lesson to each of us as individuals, but also as business and creative leaders building companies. So please welcome Patrick Finnegan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for listening to my talk. When Imran came to me and asked me to speak, I couldn't really figure out why my story mattered. It was a little puzzling to me. But as I sat and wrote this talk, I was trying to figure out. And I started comparing what I had done and who, I, who had inspired me. And it was, in the end, today, where I realized that stories matter. The stories of people alive and dead, famous and obscure, gathered in a room like this years ago, or maybe today. And they all inspired each other. Growing up, I wasn't really you know, the normal kid. I was tricky. People boxed me in. They said I was crazy. They said I had issues. But I had resilience. Despite all of the beating down and being told that I was all these different labels, I would get back every time. I wanted to be who I was. I embraced who I was. I didn't want to be anything or anyone else. So in fifth grade, I wasn't you know, on the back of the bus with a girlfriend, and I wasn't playing kickball. I was obsessed with architecture. As you can see, here's me in front of a Frank Gehry building. As I learned more about architecture, I became obsessed with him. Someone that had a polarizing reputation, yet brought the most beautiful works of architecture to the world. Bilbao, Spain, a small city in the northern port of Spain, now being one of the biggest wonders of the world because of his work. I admired someone that was able to take his work from delusional imagination to reality. I felt less alone. He stayed true to himself, he was who he was, despite the critics and adversity. It resonated with me. It was the exact thing I needed in that moment in time. I felt less alone. So, school, it got worse. DSM-4 became my best friend, which stands for Diagnostic Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders. Bipolar, Asperger's, ADHD, every label was thrown at me. My self-esteem got lower and lower. But again, I needed that person inside to inspire me, that story. And I started finding that. I remember watching John Lewis, a famous congressman for what he's done in civil rights, speak on TV about a man we all know as former President Barack Obama. I was 12 years old. I live in a small college town, very liberal. I told my parents, I'm getting involved. They didn't really understand. I was struggling, but I did it. I went from door to door, I made phone calls, I raised close to $5,000. But it didn't stop there. I started, my parents started getting calls. It was Key, New Hampshire, the headquarters. They wanted me to go. They wanted me to get involved. They had heard what I was doing, and they were interested. Weekend after weekend, we drove up to Keene. And then it became a long journey. And it also became a huge lesson, again, of why stories matter. Obama, John Lewis, they had inspired me despite being bullied and having a low self-esteem to get out of my own shell and become a part of a movement that was greater than myself. It ended up leading me to be invited to the inauguration, meet then-Senator Obama, then-Senator then Biden, and celebrate such an amazing win. So, as you can see, I was inspired. And, you know, everyone was looking at me crazy, but it didn't matter. I embraced who I was. So, school, this is really, you know, that term, rock bottom. Well, the next part, I hit rock bottom. This slide doesn't demonstrate that, though. I was in high school, boarding school. On the surface, everything looked fine. 
My peers alike thought I was cool, like as in I was going to be okay. I went to the health center, and the next day I was at home. I'll never forget. I'm in bed. I've got pills to my right, and I got a knife to my left. Police officers came in that had known me from a young age. The Williamstown Police Department. Another dream of mine was to be a police officer when I was a kid, so I was their intern at 15. Well, now they were handcuffing me to a stretcher and saying, "You got to go." That was pretty hard. My self-esteem was low. I didn't know what to do, and I didn't have any friends, and I felt alone. But again, the little engine that could, I had this entrepreneurial spark in me that was like, "I want to do something and impact others while I feel bad about myself." So I did just that. I noticed young people around me being in the best schools. They didn't really read the news. They weren't really informed, and their sources of news were pretty poor. It was Facebook or a retweet on Twitter. So I wanted to change that. I came up with World State, and in the end, I got rejected from Y Combinator and TechStars. But I was given some advice: apply for an accelerator and ask for advice. So I did it, and Portland Incubator Experiment, funded by Wyden Kennedy in Portland, Oregon, accepted me. In the end, it wasn't a massive success. But I wouldn't call it a failure either, because the next stop was New York City, and that was the extent of my plan. I had hustle, I had drive, I had my imagination, and I had a decent calling card. I started going everywhere and anywhere, and networking, and just trying to figure out things: social impact, social media, venture capital. I found my calling in venture. I liked the art of the deal. I liked getting high net worth individuals that didn't really know where to put their money into deals. It was very informal. I had no degree. I didn't even have a high school diploma. But I convinced some people. One deal I found was Lyft, that many of you know and was just on the screen before. Another deal was a content commerce company called Wine Awesomeness. So soon it became formal. I was the youngest VC on the East Coast, and I had a lot of pressure, a lot of scrutiny, and a lot of responsibility. But also, it gave me a window of opportunity. And again, I felt better about myself. I knew that I was doing something right. At the same time, though, I was building relationships with social media, social media superstars, and it wasn't until August of 2016 that I got a phone call from a peer of mine that Cameron Dallas and Jake Paul wanted to start a venture fund with me. They were killing it on YouTube and Instagram, and they had seen what Ashton Kutcher or even Carly Kloss and all these amazing celebrities had done with venture, but they wanted to take it to another level, and they wanted to invest in these companies and continuously push them and add value, short term and long term. So we started something called TGZ, and TGZ stands for Team Generation Z, obviously because we were all Gen Z. So I learned a lot about thinking like a startup and why it's really important. And you know, whether you're a small company, large company, C-suite executive, it doesn't matter. The way that these startups think, it's applicable to all of us. So the first company that I want to talk about that I learned a lot from was Dirty Lemon. And there's investors in this room that also co-invested with me. Dirty Lemon was a company that I was fascinated by. With fascinated by, Zach, the founder, understood the premise of our fund, but he also understood how to win the market. CPG, a cutthroat industry. You know, the budgets were high. Consumer packaged good is ridiculous. You have to spend millions of dollars to get these customers, and who knows if they're going to have any retention. But the thing was, is that Zach was Dirty Lemon, and Dirty Lemon was Zach. It was authentic. It was real. And so I learned from that. Again, whether you're a big brand, a small brand, a person, be who you are. Again, when Frank Gehry at fifth grade inspired me, because I wasn't sure who I was, but I knew underneath it I was okay with who I was. Dirty Lemon's okay with who they are, and they are starting to kill it. They're even in Soho House in some locations. The next company is a company called No Better Food. Foods again in the consumer package industry, very competitive. They wanted to win the market. How are they going to do this? Well, they were going to do this by creating a mission-driven company that adds value to the consumer and to the people around the consumer. So they care about everyone. They bring something healthy. They bring something that looks good. They bring something that's validated by the right people, and they have a mission-driven statement when it comes to their company. Again. I wasn't sure exactly what I was doing when I was investing in this this round. It was the biggest investors in the valley, and they were giving me a little allocation. But who knew that it would go on to be such a success? And the lesson there, again, thinking like a startup, is being mission-driven. Because in today's landscape, my generation especially, we have no patience for selfishness. You got to be selfless, and you got to care about the others around you because people love that. They want to be a part of a brand that cares about their community. The last company that I learned a lot. Was Winky Lux or Glow Concept? Makeup 
is one of the most lucrative industries, as you'll learn from Moj, but it's also one of the most competitive and cutthroat. Natalie, the founder I had met three years prior, and I didn't know what we were going to do together. When she approached me about Winky Lux, I knew she was onto something. Instead of overanalyzing the market, she went in heads first, and she said, OK, how am I going to win this? I'm going to eliminate the middleman, and I'm going to go direct to consumer. So, OK, also, why don't I make it really fast, zero to 45 days? There's only a few players out there. And she's done that, and they're already profitable, and they're killing it. And the lesson, was there, the lesson there was, again, thinking like a startup and saying, OK, instead of putting five decks together in a plan of how we can win this market, let's just go and experiment. Let's figure out how it's going to work after we put in some work. So my story is different than yours, and your story is different than the person besides you. But we all have stories, and they all matter. Again, being a bullied kid who was literally handcuffed to a stretcher by people that have known him since he was a young kid, I would never imagine that I'd be on this stage. But again, it's all about the people you surround yourself. Invest time or money, regardless, they make your story. I'll leave you guys with a quote. Margaret Atwood said, in the end, we all become stories. So why don't we start writing the one that we want? Thank you.